controls work? Yes, they do. So I can skip around and do stuff. Um, I uh, figured, though, that a nice way to start would be not with the finished game, but with the very first prototype of the game. And I can show you guys how things changed over time. Unfortunately, I have to run this one in Windows mode. Um, so this is the very first prototype of Braid that I made. I, I made it while I was on vacation, and what you're going to see is probably um, about eight or nine days of work, uh, much of which was not well spent. It was you know, doing stupid graphics stuff to work on uh, you know, older cards, uh, which was totally irrelevant by the time the game shipped. Um, Anyway, I, I made this uh, deliberately to show it to some friends. You know, I, I thought this was a cool game, and, and I wanted to mail it out to nine or ten of my game designer friends. So I was sure to make it kind of playable with instructions and stuff, even though it's a very early prototype, right? So um, it tells you the controls on the title screen. It tells you how to start playing, right? And uh, there's all this story stuff. Uh, it was in the first version of the game. The form of it here is that it just blasts this screen of text for you. And if you played the final version, you know that that's very different. Here's what it looked like. Um, I don't have focus or something. Oh, the arrow keys don't even work in this version. It's WASD. And, uh, you know, obviously, I'm thinking of the little guy as kind of a Mario esque guy. He's already got Mario character proportions, which is he's basically a square, uh, which is important, or a rectangle, um, which is very important for gameplay reasons, which we'll talk about later. Uh, jumping in this kind of sucks, it's really floaty. It's really easy to jump off the edge or to miss your jump because the center point of your guy is like off the edge of a platform or something. Um, but I had a, a sort of a full experience. Um, now, when I mailed this to my game designer friends, you know, this was a game about time manipulation, but that was kind of a surprise. Um, it, it, it appears at this point to just be a platformer with crappy graphics, and I felt like that that surprise was part of the cool thing of the game. So here, if I die, um, you know, it just restarts me at the beginning of the level. And so, you know, my friends are probably playing it, and they're like, oh, whatever. I don't know why you sent me this. But, um, I, whoops. I, I think since they were my friends, they gave me a little bit of benefit of the doubt. Um, the stuff I spent way too long doing in this prototype was like these backgrounds <coughs> of leaves, which are totally non-gameplay. It's like a flip book. Oh, man. <laughs> anyway, um, if I get to the end, there's a little dinosaur at a castle at the end there, right? Just like in the, in the regular game. Um, so that was the original World 1. And World 2 is this first time that Rewind actually gets introduced to you, and it gets introduced to you in another key hint here. And the player goes, huh, you know, what's that all about? And then they sort of figure it out. Um, I'll talk about some things real quick. Oh, please uh, silence your phones, please. So um, I want to kind of go around this level to show you the, the character of the levels that the original games had. This is a pretty big level. It starts out showing you rewind, and I'm not sure what the point is exactly yet, except that now, now I'm coming to this area. It's really a lot harder to play this when the screen's not right in front of you. Yeah, the jumping is very fiddly. And here's this jumping challenge all of a sudden, where I, where I have to use a lot of air control and go on a narrow and narrower platforms in order to get across. And uh, I think this is, um, this is far enough if I jump to get across this gap on the bottom. So um, already in this early version, there was some element of gameplay rhetoric, right? The point of that, there's a nonverbal communication there, which is like, look, this jumping thing is totally ridiculous in any other platformer, but you can do it because now you have rewind. And this goes through and, you know, it introduces keys and doors and then these clouds that you can kind of ride across. Um, the clouds in this very early version are kind of the, an old school programmy perception of clouds, which is that they're, they have an, a range of x-coordinates and they're moving and once they hit the end of one they wrap around at the beginning of the other one. So it's the same small set of clouds which is unlike what's in the final game which I'll show you later. Um, and, I, and I'll talk later about why that was important but I'll call it out now. Uh, you know we have this idea of the cannons in the original game and the, that you uh, actually this level is one of the first ones that 
more or less appears in the final game. This is a leap of faith level. This is what it looked like. And the idea is, uh, I'll try and get down to the bottom without getting killed. And it's brutally hard, but again, I have rewind, so it's okay. Um, so uh, that by itself is not, <laughs> more text. That by itself is not super interesting, but um, very early on I got this idea that, hey, can you guys see, um, can we turn down the amount of lighting on the screen? It's probably kind of hard to see the walls and stuff. Yeah, it's a little better. Um, anyway, this is, uh, this is another level that has a corresponding version in the final game, and I want to show it to you now so you can sort of see the change in character. This, is, uh, this level has a lot of monsters on it, and my original thinking was, you know, oh, you kind of go through this level, and you're going left to right, and you know you want to climb, because you usually want to climb in a platformer, but I don't exactly know what's going on, and I get down in this pit, and I stomp some guys, and I get this key, but, but now I'm stuck and I can't get out, right? Um, in, in the final game, this is just a pit in the middle of the screen, and there's nothing else on the level, right? It's a lot more minimalist, and it's a lot more focused, so there's this moment where I figure out I can rewind and hold the key. There's no... Uh, there's nothing on the key that tells you that it's magical in any way. It's just that World 3 is where keys are magical. That was the original idea. And there's not that many levels, so it worked for, you know. This is a level that's in the final game. Uh, it, uh, the idea is you kind of climb to the top here, and by the time I get up there and get this key, now I can open the door, this is the bottom. Note that I can't see the bottom from the top, so not all of the major elements of the puzzle are on the screen at the same time which is something that I worked very hard in the final game to change. So when you see this level later, you'll see that it all fits on one screen at a different aspect ratio too, a 16 by nine. So now I want to get down in there, but I, I can't kind of get in there because this wall's in the way. But you know, I can rewind back to a time when the wall was up there and keep the key. Right, so the essence of the game is here already in just eight or nine days it worked. And, uh, oh, here's another level that uh, is in the final game. People will probably recognize this. I have to jump in this pit and die to get that key. And then I come over here. Again, the level's much bigger than it is in the final game with more empty space. Here's a scary boss monster. <laughs> you know, and I kill him through various subterfuge. Yeah, all, uh, all programmer art, obviously. Um, here's World 4. This was also, uh, some of you may recognize this level from the final game. Um, I guess because we're short on time, I'll skip through that. Um, this level also made it in drastically changed uh, form to the final game. Uh, here's one uh, which is the same idea. You know, in the previous level it was time moves as you're walking left to right. As you walk to the right, time moves forward, and as you walk to the left, time goes backwards. Here there's this little up arrow saying t equals y now. The original version of the game had a sort of a mathematical sensibility to it that faded into the background as development proceeded. Now time doesn't pass at all if I move horizontally, but if I jump, it goes forward, and if I fall, it goes backward. And that was cool. Um, but it, and it, and it leads to some interesting dynamics, like, hey, I can't climb this ladder, so I have to come over here and jump on this moving guy to get up, and then I've got to like collect all these keys, but these guys are going to beam me if I don't move out of their way. Um, but so it's a, it's a different flavor of t equals x, which characterized the earlier level, but it wasn't different enough to make its own thing. You know, again, in, in the final game, Bray, um, there's a focus on minimalism and simplicity. And so even though this is cool um, to, have, to have time go when I move vertically, it, it didn't feel right uh, to keep it in the game, because it didn't add enough. It's also very hard to do a lot with it, because platformers classically go left to right. So you have to have levels with a lot more vertical motion, which is an interesting thing to explore, but it's, it's not really enough to make a big deal out of. Okay, so I'll go back into the, the game as it stands. Now, um, so the reason I like to show that prototype as well is, you know, that was done in eight or nine days. The basic game is there. You know, if you're willing to play through the stupid first world that doesn't have rewind in it, uh, which, by the way, was changed for the final game, right? You get rewind right away. Um, if you're willing to, to play through that and see the rest of it, you can see why it's cool. Um, and it's 
significantly lower production value than a lot of indie games that you see you know, posted on the web today, right? The only difference between that and a final shipping game that sold hundreds of thousands of copies is three years of development. Um, I don't know why this is not loading. So maybe it's just out of the cache. Did I click the wrong thing? Oh, I clicked the wrong thing. Task manager. Reload the task manager. I hope this doesn't crash the machine. I know it's not responding, that's why I decided to kill it. <laughs> Wait, I ran this, right? Yeah, that's what I just ran before the show, so it better work. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> so I figured it would be cool to just kind of walk through the game uh, roughly in order and show you guys um, what I was thinking in various parts. Um, and then at the end of this, you know, I'll do a Q&A and ask specific uh, questions. Um, this level here, the opening level, um, which has uh, all kinds of cool stuff in it, it's got this fiery, you know, intro. Um, you know, when I started it, the lecture it had the title braid at the top. It was really important to me um, to launch the player directly into the game and to get this, which is a sort of portrait that tells you something about what the game feels like. Um, to me, the music that's playing, it, you know, it's, it's a characteristic, you know, it's different from most music in most games that you, that you play, that you hear. Um, the music to me is sad, but also hopeful, which is um, something that I wanted, that, that's like a, a line that I wanted to run through the entire game. Um, talk more about that in World 2. You know, if I pop into the editor in this level, it's insanely complicated, actually. It's the most complicated level in the game by far. There's all these, like, particle system objects for different parts of the word braid, and this is all collision geometry, and there's a constellation back there, and there's all this markup, a lot of which is invisible right now, to, um, for things to flick on and off, you know. It's crazy how much work we put in this. The game actually cheats. It's the only example of cheating, really, in braid, where if you're out here, you know, and you're looking there, you see the constellation, but if you climb up the stairway, you see this night starry sky, and they're overlapping spatially, and like I toggle one, and toggle one off, and toggle the other one on. This level was full of bugs <laughs> until very close to shipping, because we kept adding more to it. Okay, so this is the first uh, level that you come to. Um, you get to the story part. All I'm really gonna say about the story part is game mechanical things, um, because when people started talking on the internet about what Braid means, in my opinion, uh, they tended to focus a, or disproportionately on what the text means. Uh, and that's cool. The text is an important part of the game. Um, it's interesting to think about, but it's interesting to think about in relation to the game design. And since I feel the game design hasn't gotten enough, uh, you know, certainly there's been more focus on the text than the game design, so I'm going to focus on the game design. In the original game, you know, when you start it up, uh, there's just a big screen of text, and you spacebar through it, it's all on one screen, right? After that, I broke it up into multiple screens, one per paragraph, but if you're the type who doesn't want to read something right now, which most people aren't, if you decide you like the game, you might change your mind and decide to read it later, but initially, uh, you're fighting the game if you start hitting the space bar to tab through this stuff, right? And I don't want the player to feel like they're fighting the game at the beginning. It's a bad way to... Like, the opening moments of the game, you're establishing a relationship with the player, right? You're telling them what you're like telling them what kind of time to expect to have when they're playing. And if you start it with them thinking something stupid, then that's going to probably uh, stay with them at some degree all through the rest of the game. And maybe you can, uh, maybe you can get them to forget that a little bit, but um, it's hard. You know, beginnings are the most delicate of times, which is why we work so hard on that intro level. So instead of fighting the game, um, it's a little more mild. You can feel like you're ignoring things, but you just kind of run past the text. And there's another reason to be on this screen, which is to go through these doors, right, and pick what level you're going to. Um, which um, is not perfect, but I wanted to have the story in the game, and uh, it's as close as I could get to solving that kind of problem. Yeah. 
Now, um, in this first world, uh, which is a world where you just have rewind, you know, this level serves as a wordless kind of tutorial. Um, I wanted to recall some of the um, some of the uh, imagery that is associated with really old style platformers, right? The blue sky, the sort of happy world, the childish, simple, simple world. Um, but at the same time, I wanted, you know, also through that intro sequence, but also now and through the art style, to give the impression of a world that isn't necessarily that simple, right? So the, the idea to establish here is we've got this childhood feeling of a platformer, but it's adult now, right? It's not, and things aren't simple, which is another thread that's running through the game, um, is, is taking these things and making them less clear cut. So in this level, you know, this is part of the tutorial, right? Is like, oh, what is this? Oh, I collected this thing, right? Um, there's nothing for the player to click through saying, oh, you got a puzzle piece, congratulations, or whatever, right? Um, this game, um, I didn't know this term back when I made it, but one of my goals was to uh, have the game be intrinsically motivating, right? You play it, you solve puzzles because you like the puzzles, because the puzzles are interesting, not because you're getting rewards or achieving, uh, you know, what have you, right? So already the cannons are introduced here, and there are details to the cannons that will become important later that the player's not really aware of, like the fact that there are these fuses on them that burn down and they fire when the fuse empties. Uh, that's pretty important. You get taught about double, double jumping in this puzzle, which some players don't figure out right away, but they usually get it pretty soon eventually. <coughs> that you can jump through platforms from the bottom, which you don't think about if you played a lot of platformers, but, uh, you know, otherwise, if you're new to this kind of game, it's important to show that, I think. So here's, keys are introduced, um, etc. Now this level is one of the levels of the game that bothers me the most. You know, people sometimes ask me, what do you think are mistakes with the game? Um, there's some things about this level that I don't like. Wow. The game's running kind of slow. I guess it has to do with the dual displays. Um, so on, this is the level which has the first appearance of this puzzle board. And um, hopefully most people in here have played the game, right? Otherwise it's going to get spoiled to death. But there's a puzzle involving this puzzle board where you create a platform inside it and then you move it to the right place where I can get across this gap. Uh, but the top of this platform looks pretty solid and it looks like I ought to be able to jump on it. And we kind of made it fade into the background a little bit, but it was a big bit of, uh, it's a bit ridiculous, um, especially given the rest of our art style. Um, so let me talk about that for a minute, right? Um, there are a lot of game mechanical reasons why the art style and grade is the way that it is. Um, I wanted uh, I wanted to avoid a lot of problems that games had, especially independent games, but also um, you know games of all kinds. That there's confusion when you play it about what you can do. Like it's a puzzle game already because there are puzzles that you're trying to figure out. There's going to be a certain amount of confusion as you resolve those puzzles, and so. In order for those puzzles to work very well, and to feel good, and to feel fair, there has to be no other confusion in the rest of the game. And I really, um, you know, David Hellman, the artist, really had to work with some really tight constraints that I would hammer him with all the time. So the foreground and the background always have to be in relatively divergent palettes. This first world, because we wanted a sort of feeling of comfort, is as close as the palettes ever get. Um, they're in much more contrasty colors later. Um, you know, the background always parallaxes. Uh, so there's no confusion about what's foreground and what's background. The background is done in, uh, or the foreground, I'll say, has higher frequency detail everywhere that you can touch, and places that you can't reach become lower frequency. So if you look below the, uh, you know, below the puzzle board, there's sort of some hills that are kind of down in the ground where you can't really get, and they're, uh, they're drawn with a lower level of detail than this grass over here, or the main character, or the, um, or the little platform he's standing on, right? And, and that's consistent throughout the game. Um, you know, the reason being, some, there's some kind of philosophical idea of we're creating a universe here where it communicates the things that you can touch and there's a very clear, clear set of things that you can never touch or collide with. Um, you know, some people don't like the character art, right? So I talked about before during the prototype that there's a clear reasons why the character is the shape he is. You know, he's like two and a half heads tall, He's basically a rectangle, and the reason for that is that platformers are all about trying to land somewhere with your feet, 
or you know, trying to get under something you know, horizontally. And if you're realistic human proportions, then your feet are very narrow compared to your height. And it's, it's harder to cognitively maneuver that shape uh, in a lot of crazy ways. Um, you know, which is, uh, which is why, I mean, you know, if you go all the way back to Donkey Kong, the character is this shape, roughly, and uh, it works well, and that's why people keep doing it. Um, this is the first difficult puzzle in the, well, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. So the other mistake on this level um, is the fact that you can't actually get this puzzle piece yet that you can see, or this one above the door, until you go to later levels, um, which is something that I felt conflicted about all through development. The reason I did it originally is because I wanted this to be a relatively nonlinear game. I knew that the puzzles were going to be very difficult. And I wanted people to have the option of, uh, you know, oh, this is hard, I'll come back to it later. Because there are puzzles later that might remind you of puzzles earlier, that might give you more information or, or hint at you, or just jostle your brain in the right way. Um, the problem, and that was my original uh, idea, was that that would just naturally happen. And the problem is that I playtested the game. And when I playtested the game, uh, a significant number of players, like half in my playtest sample, were sort of hardcore would not leave a puzzle if, if it was unsolved, right? They just wouldn't refuse to progress in the game. And uh, the problem is that then the whole nonlinear design kind of falls apart. The players never see it, and I worried about it a lot. And I was like, okay, I'm going to force people not to be able to solve something and come back to it later. Um, which is, uh, in retrospect, not that great of an idea. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not totally torn to bits about it, but. Uh, it's, it's a problem because now uh, when people play the final game, they have the opposite problem, which is that now when they come to a puzzle piece, they don't know if they can get it yet. Even though every single thing in the game, when you see it, you can get it, except for these on this screen right here. Um, and I changed my mind about this late in development, and I wanted to change this level, but it, it just didn't work because this, this puzzle uh, board had to go somewhere, and it couldn't really go in level three or four because those were full, and it, it would have been a massive rearrangement like two weeks before ship of like four levels. And I couldn't do it. I waited too long. Uh, so the, the lesson from that is don't play test your game. Because I didn't, I didn't play test the game most of the time, except with my designer friends at the beginning and then testing for bugs at the end. Um, this is sort of the first very hard puzzle where um, it's sort of a one-off where you're hunting down these monsters. and. Uh, if you kill this guy, you can't solve the puzzle, which is what makes it hard, because um, it's a missing information kind of thing. You get to you get over here, and you've been killing all the monsters in the game so far, and you just kind of do that out of instinct in a platformer, and then this jump is impossible. I worked really hard to make this jump appear impossible, so like it pretty much looks like there's no way you can get across. That's important because otherwise people keep trying to trying that jump over and over. Like maybe if I go a little further, I can make it. Oh, I fell off the platform. Like ah. Uh. And plus, by the time people are in this part of the game. They don't yet, they've only really thought about rewinding in terms of when you die, and they haven't yet uh, absorbed it fully into their play process. So they'll like jump, they'll miss, and they'll be like, ah, oh, damn it, you know, let me go all the way around here, right? So it's a much more uh, tedious experience than it, it should be. Um, so I felt extra important here to make that gap very wide. Um, so there's a missing information kind of thing here. You have to remember that you killed some guy, you know, or you have to leave the puzzle and come back. And, uh, and realize that there's a guy there and think with a fresh level, how am I going to get across that gap? And then you realize you could probably bounce on him. Or some people try bouncing on the guy to the upper left, um, which also can't get you far enough. Um, I like that because it's subtle. Um, because it's, it's, uh, I don't know, I won't say any more about that. We don't have that much time. Um, something that I'll, I'll really point out, you probably can't see this in the audience, but at the, at the top it says Hunt, and there's six little monster icons, and one of them's crossed out. Um, every single monster is individually painted, like it's not six icons of the same guy. And uh, every single X over them is individually painted. And as I jump over him, initially, as I, as I kill this guy, Initially, the X would just pop up and the icon would darken, you know, in a snap like that in one frame. But actually now it fades out, or, and the X fades in, as you might be able to see. And the reason for that I'll show later. 
Um, but it only became important when we started doing sophisticated time things later in the game. Um, so this level called Leap of Faith uh, existed in that prototype, right? It was the one that said sewer access and all that stuff. Um, it's a little different now, where I sort of introduce this moving platform idea. And then you're trying to fall down this pit, same as before, and get around that. Um, you know, the obstacles are much more clearly defined. There's also something that you want to do here, which is jump across this pit with the right timing. If I can do it looking at the screen. Oh, that was almost right. Come on. Uh, and so it's sort of a two-in-one puzzle, which I start doing more and more later in the game. And this is where things like that cannon fuse becomes important, because I, I did the timing. Um, a lot of platformers, when they have timed jumps, work on rhythm. So if any of you guys have played Super Meat Boy, uh, which just came out last week, it's very much a rhythm game like that. Like, there'll be things firing on the level, and they all fire at the same time, and you get into like a jump, 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 jump. And it's a timing thing. Uh, rewind destroys that rhythm. Right? If you can dynamically rewind at any time, you're inherently upsetting the rhythm of things, and so you need a visual cue. So most platformers don't give you this much of a cue, but I can watch the fuse and think about where it is and what's going on there. Oh, man. Uh, I'm playing with sucky rewind effects because the frame rate was low. I might try and, I might try and fix that later by rebooting the game. Um, Anyway, so uh, that's World 2. Um, the whole of World 2 essentially is a tutorial, right? It's to show the player that there's this world, it's got this certain set of platformer rules, um, and you can, do, you can undo things by rewinding, right? Um, it's very important to establish that baseline because I start doing weirder things later in the game, and if I hit the player over the head with very weird things that require intense thinking, they're not going to, um, if they don't have a very clear idea of the baseline, uh, it becomes much more difficult to really absorb, uh, absorb those complex ideas. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go in here, and you'll see that the palette here is very different. Uh, a much more extreme differentiation between foreground and background, um, which again, originally was for, uh, basic gameplay functionality reasons, right? I want there to be no mistake that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this gate here is going to block you and stuff like that, and that you can collide with that key and that monster. Of course, there's a little bit of inconsistency. It's like the little incompleteness theorem or something. Like, the doors needed to look very interactive, so they need to stand out, but you need to be able to walk over them and not collide. So it's like, even though we try to have this very simple visual rule, there are tiny exceptions to that, but the exceptions, I think, People never think about them. Um, now, there was an interesting thing, though, uh, as game development went on. Um, you know, so I showed you the original version of this level. It was the one with like the nine or ten monsters and the pit way up in the upper left corner. And eventually, I, I found myself being driven to simplify levels because, uh, as I was making this game, I found that the simpler things were the better they were, right? The more beautiful the puzzles were and the solutions were, because when you solve one of these puzzles, you feel like you've understood something fundamental, right? Because there's these rules to this toy universe that you're in, and you've understood something basic about the rules, and you've had an aha moment. Um, and it wasn't obfuscated, right? The level here isn't obfuscating anything, so you get a maximum sort of hit from that understanding. Whereas if it's, the level's full of tons of complicated stuff, and you're doing a bunch of crazy things, just to get to this point where, oh, and I'm supposed to rewind the key out of the pit. Um, you know, like so. This is really all that I'm supposed to do in this level. I'll just realize I can't get out and then kind of rewind my way back out. Um, you know, if you obfuscate that, then it's less fair in a sense. It's like, oh, the designer was hiding it from me as opposed to that was in front of my face the whole time. And then I realized it and it was like, wow, right? Um, so there's a kind of beauty and simplicity that I was going for with this game. And then the other interesting thing that I found, um, you know, this happens with a lot of puzzle games, but it really happened a lot with Braid, is that people would be stuck on some relatively hard puzzles, and they'd quit for a while. They'd go eat lunch, right, or they'd go to bed, go take a shower, and, and when they're done, or when they wake up the next day, they know the answer to the puzzle, right? 
Um, you know, our, our subconscious works on things, you know, all the time, but um, I think that there's something about the simple layout of the levels, the extreme crispness of the foreground versus the background, that permits your brain uh, to store some symbolic representation of the level as efficiently as it can, or much more efficiently as happens with most games. Um, and that's why people solve these more easily with their subconscious. I mean, I have no, I have absolutely no neuroscience training at all, so I have no real uh, justification for that. But just experientially, that's my explanation for what happened. So this, again, was in that prototype, right? Almost unchanged, except that it fits on the screen, and it's a little bit simpler. The goal is just to get the key and rewind. Um, you know, everything, so as opposed to uh, the, the prototype, when the idea was keys are magical, now it is anything that sparkles is magical and doesn't follow the rewind rules, right? Which allows me to, you know, actually the gates weren't magical in the prototype too. And that's all I do so far here, but now I can do other things, right? I can make clouds immune to time rewind. So here's a very simple level where the idea is just that uh, statically, this is unsolvable. If I go and I try to jump, you know, I'll, I'll wait for these clouds to come over, you know, and it's just too far to jump, right? Um, I can, I can use rewind to phase shift one set of clouds with respect to the other. Uh, in, when it's running in higher fidelity graphics mode, you can see more clearly which things are time distorted, but it's all these things with the green dots coming off them. Hopefully you guys can see that in the background. Whoops. So, uh, you know, basically I line it up like this and then I can jump across. And of course part of the problem is that now if I rewind I mess up the phase shift. So there's actually a higher penalty for failure, right? Like say I, I miss this jump and I'm like, oh, I want to rewind up there. It's like, oh, what's going on? I have to actually rewind to one of these clouds and like phase shift myself over, right? If I rewind while I'm on this one, it'll like come out from under me and I'm screwed. Um, so there's a lot of interesting behavior here already with very simple rules. And so I didn't have this idea in the beginning. You know, my idea at the beginning of the game was I want to make a game where every world is some crazy different thing about quantum mechanics. So like there's going to be the like, no arrow of time world where you have to be able to do your thing forward versus backward, right? Um, things like that. But uh, it turned out that when I would make these very simple modifications to the rules of time, there were all kinds of really interesting consequences. And making puzzles, uh, the exploration and the illustration of consequences, right? So, you know, this level, this is maybe not the clearest example of this, but this level is about like, oh, here's this thing where you can statically set up a solution and jump across. Some players don't notice that, other players do. Um, but then it gets more complex. It's like, here's another version of the same. <coughs> um, the difference is that you can't statically set up a solution here, right? I could try, um, whoops. Yeah, I should actually have waited. But you know, if I get, If I get this cloud over here, right? Oh man, penalty for failure. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, <laughs> the idea behind this one is, um, oh, you know, that would have been the perfect time. This is good. So I can jump across here, but now, you know, there's no, there's only one cloud to go there, and I either have to toggle the rewind, right? Um, or if I'm advanced, right, I can freeze. Whoops, I can freeze time and like wait for the cloud to come around. Either way. Um, now I spoke at the beginning about the little uh, thing about, hey, obviously if I'm making these clouds that you jump across as a programmer, I'm going to make them wrap within some region. Um, that doesn't really work uh, because when someone is trying to cognitively like work their way through this puzzle, they don't. You know, like I said, they don't know the rules of your world, and they're trying to figure them out. And actually making things more physically plausible in some simple platformer world sense helps people figure things out. So, uh, you know, I made it so that clouds have a limited lifespan, and they go and they always collide with something and puff away, right? So you can tell when you rewind, you can see them sort of re-solidify on the left there. Like that. Um, it just helps things make more sense. And you don't have to, you know, you don't have to see that and go, oh, I see. You know, clouds magically wrap, they teleport from the left, left to the right, and if I slow one down or I do something to one of them, it's the same one when it wraps. Um, 
So yeah, uh, clouds didn't usually fire from cannons. That was a post prototype addition, an addition to the game. So now I just, uh, you know, I just got done saying about how I thought simplicity was beautiful and there was a very minimalist drive in Brave. There are exceptions. This level is an exception. Uh, it's giant, it's full of monsters that there's not that much of a reason for except that it's funny. Um, so you start running along and you get a couple of these rabbits. This is where the rabbits are introduced, by the way, which is part of the reason why this level is the way it is. Um, so you know you keep coming along and then you start getting chased by more rabbits and you know maybe you run away and maybe you manage to kill them that way. Uh, and then there's an even more ridiculous number, you know. Um, maybe you kill, whoops. Maybe you kill them this way. Ah. So, so part of what this was um, is a pattern break, where um, even though I have very uh, strong guidelines, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to break them sometimes, you know. And this is one of those. Uh, another pattern break is that very first puzzle. You know, people always ask me about that. Like, why is there this puzzle where? Uh, you know, um, you can put a platform in one of them, or you can discover a platform, but in the rest of the game, no other puzzle does that. Um, well, A, my original thought was, of course, there should be something in every one of those puzzles that you put together, like, oh, you'll put together pieces of a key in the next one, and that'll give you a key that you can use to open a door, and stuff like that. And I think, um, I think a lot of platformers would have done that, um, but that started to take the focus away from um, away from the core of the game, which was investigating these rules of how time behaves in all these various places. So uh, it didn't feel right. You know, it, it's the obvious thing, like sometimes the obvious design decision, the obvious like, this makes the game most complete and most whole is actually wrong. Um, I felt a lot better if that was a pattern break and if, it, um, and if it allowed me to focus on time rules the rest of the time. And in some ways, that's the element of magic in World 2. World 2 being the first one you enter that lets you rewind. You know, in all these other worlds, um, there's a twist. And, and that's kind of the, the twist in World 2, even though it doesn't make sense. And the fact that it doesn't make sense is what made it appeal to me so much. Um, I'll talk for a minute about all these levels. So, you know, each level, uh, you know, as you enter it, um, puts this big icon in the name of the level, right? And the reason for that was so that when you come back later and you're hunting for all these puzzle pieces, it gives you an index. Like, you, figure, you have to figure this out as a player, but oh, this number is how many puzzle pieces are in each level. And here's the icon which reminds me what was in that level if I've played it before, right? And probably you have to play it a couple times to really remember those icons uh, on the doors. But um, I felt they were really helpful um, in communicating non-verbally, um, which was, again, a thing that I was interested in. Obviously, there's a lot of verbal communication in the game, right? There's all this crazy story stuff, um, but there's a bunch of nonverbal things as well, uh, you know, rhetoric in the game design. Uh, for example, in that Leap of Faith level where you're supposed to jump down the pit, um, the reason that exists is that that's one of the classic ideas of platformers, right? Anytime you sit down and make a platformer, if you don't know what the term Leap of Faith means, you're probably out of your depth making a platformer, right? Or you're not aware of history. Um, because what that is, is a it's a statement about, um, you know, early platformers were unfair in certain ways. And one of them is, if you have to jump down a pit and see what's down there and consequently die before you know if you're supposed to go that way, or before you know exactly where you're supposed to jump, then that's unfair because you've got this limited number of lives and you're screwing the player over and stuff like that. Well, part of the rhetoric, you know, one of the simplest pieces of gameplay rhetoric in this game is that the Leap of Faith level is there, and it's called Leap of Faith very blatantly as a statement that, hey, when you've got rewind like this, it's actually okay. You can kill the player all you want. You know, um, It doesn't really matter because this game isn't about whether you live or die. In fact, you have to die a few times to complete the game. Uh, here's a level that a lot of people hate. Um, so uh, this is the first level 
in the game that you can fail irreversibly, and it's called irreversible as a hint about that. And also as a slight nod to the comic that David Hellman, the artist for the game, did before Braid, it was called A Lesson is Learned, but the damage is irreversible. Um, what's going on is there's this vertical platform that's immune to uh, time manipulation and a horizontal one, and if I ever get killed, like this, right, and then I rewind, that platform doesn't ever go back down. You can see it creeping slowly up. And if I rewind it all, basically, then by the time I try to get up there to where it is, it'll have elevated itself so far that it blocks that horizontal platform and I can't reach that puzzle piece in the upper left corner. And the solution is not to rewind. Um, and there's two ways to do it. One is to be like crazy, you know, whoops, I obviously failed. Turn it around. Um, I'll try to bring it on the monitor here. Um, obviously, I'm awesome at this game. So, you know, you can kind of do all this stuff, but this is not actually, you know, and, and to sort of discourage that or make it more crazy, like stuff happens when you come here and it's like, oh no, but maybe you realize if you keep a cool head, you're above them and, and you kind of have to make it over here. Oh, I died, but now this is the interesting thing is I made it long enough. Well, now I screwed myself. If you live for long enough, then uh, this first platform, uh, the horizontal one comes out and covers the vertical one. And so the actual, the, the better solution to the level is just to beat these guys. Oh, you don't suck. <laughs> so you, you really just have to do that. And then you just kind of hang out over here. You know, once you, because um, my design goal, in as much as I could do it, is to make it so that uh, you know, if you understand a puzzle, there's a relatively easy way to execute it. And sometimes um, I succeeded at that, and sometimes it was more difficult. Uh, but you know, here, now I can solve the puzzle, and in fact, I can go die, you know, over here, and I can actually rewind, and that top platform is still blocking the bottom line, and it'll still work. Um, now there's this other puzzle over here, which is also irreversible. A lot of people complain about this level. They say, oh, it's, uh, you know, the game's broken because uh, before, you know, it's the first time when, or it's the only time people think, which actually isn't true, when you can solve, when you can mess things up irreversibly and have to leave the level to get a puzzle piece. And the cool thing about the game was that Rewind makes it so that you don't have to do that, right? And um, that's not true. Uh, the cool thing about World 2 is that Rewind makes it so that you can solve anything you want, right? But by the time we're through World 2, We've understood that idea, hopefully, right? If you're, if you're at the head of the class, you understand that idea, and it's cool, and you're like, wow, you know, I, I don't have to worry about dying. I can solve puzzles, and I can throw a switch the wrong way and knock it on the platform and rewind the platform, and I'm cool. So, great, and the idea was that, uh, okay, that's done. Let's move on, and let's go deeper into these ideas. And so the rest of Braid is about, uh, you know, exploring the consequences of these uh, rule changes, as I mentioned, but not just exploring arbitrary ones or ones that feel nice or ones that create fun levels. It's exploring things fully, right? And, you know, when I discovered this quite by accident, probably on the first day I was playing with it, um, I was like, oh, that makes things irreversible. Maybe that's bad. Well, no, it isn't because that's interesting. It's an interesting consequence. And the game, in my opinion, would be incomplete if, uh, if it didn't have this level and, uh, and this consequence in the gameplay. Now, that's again counter to the way many people design games. I would claim most people, right? Because they focus cast or they, they have people just play it informally and say, oh, what did you think? And they'll say, oh, that one level sucked. It wasn't fun. Um, this level isn't that fun for a lot of people, and I knew it when I made it. It's intentionally not that fun, but it's there to make the game complete, and the completeness gives the game a little more depth than it would have had otherwise. Um, it's part of the integrity of the work, right? So this game really isn't about being fun maximally. And here's, here's another example of that. So I've got to get past this guy. So here's the first time you sort of use a key twice, which is cool. You just kind of rewind and the gate doesn't, you know, because it's immune to time. So I get on here, and then uh, this is intentionally a setup to ensure that the player is paying attention. Right? So there's this key, and I can go grab it, and I'm like, huh, okay. It's in, that's the wrong thing to do, but I intentionally put it right in front of the player's face so that usually they would do it. 
Uh, a cool thing is that I don't, I don't have to navigate my way through those guys twice. I can just rewind. Most people don't realize that. Um, here's the critical moment. At this point, if I'm paying attention, if I'm thinking, if I'm not sleepwalking through the game, I should realize I know there's only two keys here. There's no other way to get them, or I'm pretty sure that there's no other way to get them back. Um, because if I rewind this, I know that gate will close. And I'm about to use this one up on this door, and neither one will rewind. So how do I open the third gate, right? If you're approaching this in a puzzle-solving mindset, you see that you're about to screw yourself. But most people don't. Most people just go, huh, OK, now what do I do, right? And, uh, and then they search around, and they can't find any more keys, and then they get pissed off, right? Um, but up until when I just did that, even though I used the wrong key first, I could have rewound everything that I did. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. And in fact, <laughs> one of the themes I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is when there are rule decisions that seem arbitrary, but they have to be made one way or the other. Right? So there's a question, if I'm holding two keys and they're not indistinguishable, if one is exempt to time manipulation and the other one isn't, which one do I hold? And which one do I drop? Because you can be holding this exempt key and rewind back to the time when you held the other key and what happens. And what happens is you go back to holding the other key. Um, it was a decision that had to be made one way or the other. And this way generated an inter interesting puzzle. Now, it's also true that if you, if you do it in the right order, which is opening the first gate with the second key here, um, then it reduces to exactly this puzzle that was above, which is where you have a non-exempt key, you have an exempt door, and a non-exempt gate right next to each other. right? So the right two gates over here are the same as the two on top. And so if you're looking at it in a pattern matching kind of way, it also, uh, it also makes sense. Uh, almost nobody does that. right? Almost everybody fails this level on the way through. So it's, it's in there as sort of a like, hey, you know, there are things to maybe pay attention to in this game. Um, another kind of mistake, this part of the game isn't that minimal. There's like all these little guys down here that I like have to kill, and it's frustrating when people get killed and stuff. Um, I kind of like this guy, though. Because, you know, you're heading for the gate, the door, and you're like, oh, I'm done. And it's like, oh, crap. You know? um, but really, it doesn't quite fit the game. And if I were to do it over, I'd get rid of those couple of rabbits. And I'd get rid of this cannon, because this cannon is not there for any reason. And it, it just serves to create a barrier before this. And I could have created that barrier spatially. You know, and this cannon ends up killing people for no interesting reason. It's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't go through with the right timing, and now I just have to try again and again. And some people like try ten times to get through there. It's not cool. It's not what the game's about. Um, so this next level, of course, you saw this boss level. Um, this is almost exactly the same level. You know, it's shorter vertically, so you can see that, so it doesn't scroll vertically. Same guy. He doesn't put words on the screen because I thought it was better if he was wordless. Um, but basically the same. Uh, you know, he runs back and forth differently. Horns pop off as a visual clue of what's going on in addition to the things overhead. He's got a different scream for every single horn that pops off as opposed to playing the same sound effect five times. Um, I think, yeah, I think every X at the top is different. Um, that idea of the uniqueness of icons, that the game was handcrafted, is something that I ideally wanted to do everywhere, but couldn't. Uh, like for uh, for budget purposes, right? Like for every monster in the game, there are some screens with like eight or nine. I would have liked to have a different animation set so that those guys could all look slightly different, but it would have cost a ton of money because I was broke and uh, a lot of time, and uh, just didn't didn't work out that way. Uh, okay, so I'm back to this level uh, where time moves uh, with my uh, with my position. I think this is the first instance of a reprise, right? So here's a, a level that's uh, it's got kind of world three-ish on the left vegetation to remind you of that, and world four, which is sort of this desert structure on the right. But it's the same structure. There's a pit with a key and a monster in the bottom, uh, but with alterations. Um, you know, in, in classical music, uh, something which seems to have been forgotten by a lot of modern musicians, um, one of the very basic ideas behind good music is that uh, there's this idea that restatement is valuable and repetition is not. Repetition is when you take the same pattern and it just happens again and again, and there's no new information content coming into the music or coming into the communication. 
with each repetition, it's just the same thing. So like most electronic is that way. Um, classical music, you'll get the same sequence of notes different, or you know, with a different you know, instrument played alongside in a different way. Um, and it, it, it's a way of reminding you of something, but then bringing something different into the, into the um, fold. And you can create something very rich that way. And so um, with these sort of reprises, I was looking to do that, and also to create a little bit of a dreamlike, like, I've seen this before. You know? um, this level, uh, the game's got a little bit of a sadistic streak. Um, this is the first level that really shows it. Although the design of these monsters, you know, uh, is part of that. Like they look a little bit grumpy. Um, they don't like what they're doing. And if you look at kind of closely, you probably won't be able to see it here, but they sort of whoops. They sort of cry as they're dying. Unlike a lot of platformer monsters, which don't want you to feel bad about killing them, right? So this is again bringing some uh, lack of clarity into the classical platformer thing, like. You know, if I'm looking closely, maybe I feel bad about squashing that guy. I mean, he obviously didn't get a very good role in life. I mean, he's kind of unattractive and I don't know. Um, so anyway, uh, so you kind of have to have him get the key this time. And in order for enough time to pass for him to get the key, you have to walk forward to here. Um, then I can come down in the pit, and I can actually kill him, but that doesn't help. Because I have to go left far enough to get the key, which makes him come back alive. So anytime that I have this key and open this gate, he's going to be alive. Uh, but then to get out, he has to die. There are spikes on the left that I can see, and like, oh, I have this moment, like, oh, no, man. And then he has to die. But what has to happen has to happen, right? So, you know, I'm always, you know, when I was developing this game, I was always, most of those moments would happen by serendipity, but then I would look for ways to focus on them and magnify them. Uh, here's that Donkey Kong level. Um, it's simplified. There isn't as much stuff. I think actual Donkey Kong has one more layer, but to fit it vertically and to have big jump heights and stuff, um, I kept it this way. Uh, there's a sort of a whoops. there's a parallel construction over on the right side of the map, which is uh, you know like a more of a layered thing, which brings in the same idea that like oh I can't go this way, so I have to navigate my way up. And as with a lot of platformers, there's little secrets here, so most people are like, oh man, I've got to do this like control for jumping, which is hard because, you know, time won't pass, right? So I have to jump and like go, right? But actually, if you're speed running, so there are speed runs in the game after you finish the whole thing, and if you're speed running, in order to get this level under the par time, you probably have to kind of do this, right? And, whoops. You can actually sneak around all the fireballs and just go up here and get this, oops, get this, and then just rewind up your way all the way back out to where you use the key. Oh, except I didn't start, but you rewind your way back up there. Okay. This is another gotcha moment here. Of course, I just rewound my way to the bottom. Oh, well, I don't want to um, this is another thing people hate, and a lot of people don't understand. You know, they complain about it on forums and stuff, but I think it should be obvious, right? So here, I just, remember, I've just gone over here, I've just gotten this key, right? As soon as I've gotten this key, I remember, oh, there's that puzzle piece over there. Maybe I get the one on the right first, but either way, I remember, okay, I've got this key, here's some gates. If you're approaching the game and not sleepwalking through it, which most people are, I mean, admit, and, and when I sleep, say sleepwalking through it, I don't want to, you know, say, oh, people are bad people, or they suck for sleepwalking through it. It's almost inevitable at this point, because a lot of concepts have hit your mind. And you just get kind of tired at some point. Um, it should be an alarm bell that there's two gates entering this thing, and thus there's a choice about which way I come in. And it, as soon as it occurs to you that there's a choice about which direction, it should be obvious. Well, I should be going to the right. Because if I'm going to the left, time won't pass for this gate. And what will happen if time won't pass? I'm not sure, but it's probably not good. And in fact, what happens is, Time passes for the key because it's exempt to time manipulation. Time doesn't pass for the gate. This isn't uh, something I explicitly programmed in as a screw you thing. This is the natural outcome of the rules of time, right? And this is an illustration of that. And uh, people get mad uh, because they feel like they got slapped, right? Uh, which they did. Um, but that's okay because it's the way the universe works, man. Um, So here's this hunt level again, and I'm going to show you why there's so much more detail in these icons at the top, although they are pretty small, um, which is unfortunate. I'll come over here. 
So you know, there's a lot of running back and forth here. So this level automatically becomes a lot more challenging, whereas before it was about just getting rid of all the guys. Now you have to stomp them in a very specific order that you kind of figure out, like playing with a combination lock. It's kind of cool. Um, but suppose I stomp on this guy while I'm doing this figuring out process, and I come back over here. This moment that was instantaneous in the earlier level, like he was alive, now he's dead, now is no longer instantaneous because I can come back and, uh, or at least it looks bad because I can focus on it now. I can take very small steps and I can like creep through time. And so I, it felt better to me if this moment was continuous when you inspect it. And like, oh, the X is fading out, I'm going right, it's fading back in. It's fading out and the icon brightens up, right? Um, it seemed necessary to me that if the gameplay provides that level of precision in time dialing, that certain things that you wouldn't pay attention to, now you have to pay attention to. Because you've given the player, you've told the player to inspect them, right? I don't think that very many people notice that, but again, it's one of the things that actually gives the game depth in my mind. And it took a little bit to do. Uh, let's get this. Okay, here's a crazy level. Um, I haven't actually asked people about this. Um, my suspicion is that most people don't think that hard about this level and understand what's going on. Uh, but basically, there's two layers of clouds here. Uh, and one of them is traveling to the right, always. And one of them is traveling to the left, always, right? But because, um, because time is locked to my direction, right? They'll switch direction when I switch direction. And that's just because we're going forward in time, we're going backward in time. Now, if what time it is depends on how much you move, then the speed at which you move controls how fast time passes. And so a natural question, right? I had to ask this intellectually, right? This didn't come out of natural experimentation quite. Um, is what should happen when you're on something that moves you as you move? And the answer is it depends on what direction it goes, right? So if I'm on a cloud moving to the right, my momentum adds to its momentum. That's the way most platformers work, right? If you're standing on a cloud, you'll ride with it. You don't have to run to keep up with it. Because you're riding with it, it's giving you speed. And then if you ride across the cloud, your momentum adds, right? It's just like any Newtonian mechanics, right? Already how most platformers work, because it feels really big. You don't want the cloud to slip out from under you or anything. Um, so now what that means is that if I'm riding on a surface that's moving, then my speed is actually increased. Right? And so time should move faster uh, if, I'm, if I'm moving to the right and if I'm running on something that goes to the right. And actually, if you solve, there's an equation you can solve in closed form that actually tells you how fast time should go. And uh, there's, a, there's an if statement in the code that actually solves that equation. And these are going to the left, so they subtract from my speed, and so things go more slowly, and that creates this interesting jumping puzzle. Um, my bet would be that 90% of players don't even really think about that. They're just like, oh, this is weird. This is kind of trippy. I don't kind of know what's going on. Um, you know, the music speeds up and slows down here, as it does all the time in the game, which again is not, um, it, it's an aesthetic choice, but it's not an aesthetic choice made for maximal pleasingness, right? It makes music sound kind of bad sometimes, um, but this game is about the rules of the universe dominating, and so everything being subject to those rules made sense. And if, you know, music is kind of, a thing that is added, right, like most, when I'm walking alone in my house, unless I turn on something, there's not like music magically playing that's emanating from the universe, right? Um, so, that I can hear. Um, so, um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but uh, it, there's a choice about what happens with the music, and it felt important to me to reinforce this time behavior, which is fundamental. Um, so I did that. Uh, one actual other consequence of this, this actually means that uh, you know, special and general relativity do not hold in the world of grade. Uh, because time goes faster when I run faster, for me at least, uh, so maybe it would actually, but because it actually does objectively run faster for the only universe, that means that there is an ether at velocity zero, and there's, there's no such thing as relativity in that way, if you cared. Um, but it's actually the kind of thing that you want to think about, you know, if you're designing a platform. <laughs> Okay, so here's another, uh, here's another example of a decision that had to be made. Um, most keys, or every single key in this world up till this point is sparkly. It's exempt from time manipulation because that is what meant that you could handle it and do what you want with it. 
Um, and of course, the game would not be complete if I didn't ask the question, what happens if you hold a key that is not sparkly, right? And I knew the behavior would be weird, but what, what exactly should it be? Um, well, clearly, if you walk to the left, it's rewinding, right? Um, so there's that. You know, and I can walk way over here, and it'll, it'll move separately from me. And if I walk to the right, it simulates forward, which means it just falls on the ground. If I walk to the left, it keeps tracking you know, where I was. Um, there are a couple of valid ways that that decision could have been made, but I had to pick one. Um, that's one of them. Um, a lot of people, so, so the, you know, to solve this level, basically, anytime you're trying to do something useful with this key, you have to be moving to the right, which is why this thing is up here to sort of require you to move to the left. Um, it means that if you try to do the obvious thing, which is get that key and carry it up this ladder, you can't actually carry it left and use it because it'll disappear out of your hands. Um, again, that's not a special case hack. Um, <clears throat> it's a rule that had to be decided, um, and it was decided in this fashion. Um, there were other ways to decide the rule, but it made things that were actually felt more broken. This was the, more, the most continuous and interesting way to do it. Um, so what you actually have to do is you have to be tricky about, uh, you know, uh, getting the key up here on the left and then carrying it to the right. I'm going to go pretty fast through the rest of these because we started late and I've been told that we have a hard time deadline. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like I've said a lot of the more important things. Um, here's another reprise level. Um, or again, you have to go down in the pit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this time, though, the key is that you don't actually rewind to get out, but like, um, you know, so th what this level is about is you do stuff, and then you rewind, and then your guy goes and does what you did in a shadow world. Right now, it just looks like a shadow guy, but it's actually an entire parallel universe, which you can see alluded to by the fact that you can see the shadows of uh, all those platforms and stuff. Um, so if I actually go and I jump on this guy, actually, I'll let him walk back and forth here, and then I'll rewind a bunch, and then I'll go jump on him. You can see there's an entire version of him in a parallel universe still acting, right? So the entire world gets simulated, and that's key to a couple of later, later puzzles. Um, what's neat to me about this level is how minimally soluble it is. Like for speed runs, it's like I'm just running in and I go, whoop, okay. You know, so it's like, it's another, it's another like expert solution um, where you use the momentum of your guy to fall on the piece. Um, um, here's a level that, uh, it's the first level, you notice when I load it, uh, it has no subtitle, it's just an icon of a guy standing extra pit. Um, this is a level uh, where you have to Again, use yourself in a kind of manipulative or sadistic way. What you eventually figure out is that the only way to get this key over to where you can use it is by jumping across this pit and like dying, right? And then rewinding and standing close enough to where I can pick up the key precariously. Um, and again, it, the first time I did that, I was like, wow, that feels, uh, feels kind of weird. Um, you know, is, like, is that me anymore? Now that I've rewound it and assuming an autonomous thing, is that me, is that someone else? What's going on? Um, I like the feeling that I got there, right? The original version of this level didn't have a pit full of spikes. Uh, it actually had a wall with a tiny hole in it that you pass a key through. And uh, I didn't like that at first because it was just, it was like signaling that that was the solution to the puzzle. Because you've never seen a wall with a tiny hole in it before. So it's like, oh, well obviously I do something with that hole. Um, but eventually it became more about that feeling, right? Of, I use myself in this kind of weird way. And that's why the level has no title. Um, because it's, it's trying to talk about that feeling that I got when I played it. And um, I didn't really have a word for that. So skipping ahead a bit. Uh, here's, a, here's a boss level again. It's a reprise of the boss level. And um, the interesting thing about it is that you you know, it's the same guy, it's roughly the same level with some changes, a restatement of the level, but you, you win in a different way, right? What you do is you actually, but 
The way you win is actually by dropping these shadow chandeliers on the guy. Because if you don't use the shadow ones, then you'll, you'll run out. Um, so it's really kind of a different solution. It, it has to be performed in a different way than the earlier level. I'm sorry if I keep getting quiet. I just realized I keep getting back here. Um, here's a reprise of that. Oops, paused. This level's kind of neat, again, because it takes people a long time to figure out, but once you figure it out, it's got a very uh, expert, minimal solution that, again, involves that player momentum, right? So I go, whoop, whoop, and, you know. The idea being that there's, the key is not shared between universes, uh, but it's rewind exempt. So you have to use two of them, but without ever touching the door first, which is what you usually do. Because if you touch the door, you'll break the key, and you can't rewind the key. Hold six. This is the last reprise of that pit level. Um, and there's actually no gameplay here because I wanted a pattern break again, right? Um, if it's like there's always a puzzle piece in the bottom, um, then sometime that, some, at some point, you know, a puzzle piece and a monster, at some point, yes, you're playing on that theme all the time, but it becomes, um, it becomes rote, it becomes less special, it becomes mundane, right? So at this point, the player's like, oh, what's going on? Now I can press Y and, uh, it's about kind of just being a playground for this. And it's sort of signaling that this is going to be very important. You know, and sort of getting the feel for how the music speeds up and slows down as I run around. If you sit here for a while, you'll see that the snowflakes in the background uh, congeal at a higher density uh, behind, uh, you can sort of see it around the top of the ring right now. Um, You'll end up with a, with a higher density field as opposed to lower density snowflakes elsewhere, which is a natural consequence of sort of having this vortex of time and slowness in there. Um, it actually, uh, the, the particle system used for weather in most of the other worlds is different from this one. I had to program this one separately because this one had to be able to have a position of time for every separate particle, which uses rewind data, which is a scarce resource. Um, so this is actually being done uh, with a separate system, and uh, the levels in World 6 take more memory than the levels in the earlier game. But nobody ever really notices that. Another reprise of this level, this time the solution is different. This time I don't rewind at all, or I, you know, I don't need to solve it. I just, uh, you know, what I do is I just slow this guy down, and then I do the straightforward thing of going up to the top and coming back down, and uh, he's in the right place where I need it to be. Um, Here's again a reprise of that cloud puzzle, and again it, it has this pattern of a simpler solution, which is like, hey, I just kind of slow things down enough for the next cloud to catch up. And then a more complex version that happens on the right-hand side where I have to do something trickier, but with the same basic concept, which is enabling it so that I can jump from cloud to cloud. This level is one of my favorites, uh, even though it's complicated. Right? Again, I said that minimalism is important in this game, but we're getting toward the very end, and I felt like complexity uh, was worth something at this point. Um, this is three separate puzzles, and they, are all, they all interact with each other. So it looks like to get this puzzle piece in the upper left, I want to get up this elevator, um, but that's actually not the solution. So it's a decoy. What I really want to do is bounce off some monsters um, to uh, <coughs> To get the puzzle piece that's under it, um, I need to move that elevator, which means I need to get in that gate, which means I need to get this key in the upper right, uh, which is, uh, and to do that, I need to interact with this monster. But to bounce off this monster, I need to control this cannon, which is actually also the way of guarding this cannon, which I need to drop this ring on top of to get in the gate. Um, if you play the game and solve it, you'll know what I mean, right? But it's like each level provides a bit of a fiction excuse for the elements in the other level, and they're all intertwined, but there's three separate puzzles. Um, I found that really fascinating, and I did that again in World 6, um, in, a, in a level or two. Um, this one, this is a reprise of that irreversible level. At least the left half is a reprise of irreversible, and the right half is a reprise of a different level. And uh, what happens over here, this is again one of those things that I designed knowing that it wasn't that fun. Um, what, after you sort of play with this and figure it out a little bit, 
uh, it, the solution to this level appears to be like, oh, these guys are trying to get over here, and I need, I need to actually bounce off two of them. I might get one guy all the way over here and jump off him, and I find I can't bounce high enough. So it's like, oh man, I gotta get two. How do I do that? And it's like, oh, I've gotta slow these claw guys down. Oops, that wasn't slow enough. And then, okay, that, he can get past the first one. Oh, and he got past the second one. Oh, I got lucky here, actually. Wow, okay, that almost never happens. Usually what happens is I screw it up like that, right? And then I'm like, oh, I've gotta fix this, slow him down again. But by the time I do that, because this thing has a, a non-zero radius, right, now it's screwed up the first two, right? So a lot of players get into this really heavily brute force thing where they keep trying over and over to like try this one and try that one until they finally get it. And you can do it that way. Um, there's a second level of realization about this puzzle, though. And, and that brute force solution, by the way, is not pleasant. It feels hacky, it feels gross, it's like, uh. And that is the major player experience for most people playing the game, and I knew that as a designer going in. But there's a couple of other consequences. Like, one of them is, you know, I mean, say you slow something down. Let me get this back. He's way too fast right now. Okay, so he's timed right right now. And then I go over here and I do some stuff to slow this guy down. And I mess up the first guy's timing, and I'm like, oh, I broke it. I can actually rewind that. Because all this stuff is, whoops, I rewind too far. But all this stuff is reversible, and so it's, this level is actually pretty forgiving, um, right? Uh, so you can solve the puzzle much more easily that way by using rewind when you mess up and whatever. But there's actually a simpler solution, which I'll show you guys, um, which doesn't require any of that, and just requires you to be more familiar with the game. Um, and this is what. Again, what the speedruns are for, they're to require the player to come to this level of understanding of the system. Oops. I just slowed things down and then I paused uh, while all the guys. So I slowed the middle guy down so that they're all in the ground at the same time. And now I can let as many guys march over as I want. And then they go. So it really takes a couple of seconds if you're not talking to an audience to do that puzzle. Um, and then I can get, whoops. If I don't screw up the jump, I can get up there. Um, <laughs> And you need to do that to get the speed run. So it's a way in which the speed run isn't just, um, it's not just about uh, making things harder or making you go through the game faster or spend, extending playtime. It's about deepening the understanding of the puzzles. And the reason I like this puzzle so much is because it has this three or four layers to it uh, that you can go through gradually. Um, and yeah, yeah it, made, it made for a worse uh, play experience for most players, but I only really debated that to myself for like 10 minutes because it clearly made the game deeper and, and was kind of fascinating. Like when I made the puzzle, this is important actually, when I made this puzzle, I thought the solution was going to be the brute force thing and that the brute force thing would be easier to do than it was. And in the course of playing it, I very quickly came to the understanding of those other ways to solve it. And that was a wow moment for me and I felt that that was necessary to preserve. Um, here's a... Here's another uh, puzzle where there's uh, some combinatorics going on. These are more limited, where the area on the left is cut off. But in this area on the right, one of the puzzles uh, provides fictional explanation for other things, right? So, uh, you know, I get up here, and sort of the, the way that I'm supposed to get up uh, to the top is maybe riding on, on this platform. Let's, That. Um, and then I sort of time this jump. So um, just before I did that, I needed to slow down the cannon because the cannon's firing too fast, right? So I do this and then do that. Um, but that's sort of the fictional explanation for that platform. But you know, the real explanation or the real reason that that platform is there um, is not just for that that puzzle, uh, which is cool by itself, but it's so that I can do this. Whoops, not die. Um, so I can do that, and I can actually switch the order of the, of the platforms, right? So there's like another puzzle hidden inside this one, um, which is something that I really liked. It's not minimalist though, right? But it is like, it's something about the way things interplay, which I felt was uh, fascinating. If I was going to do a pattern break in World 6 from minimalism, then this was the kind of thing I wanted to explore. Um, this is the last level before the very end. And uh, this level uh, used to be something a lot stupider, um, or that didn't work as well, and that went through a lot of permutations until about one week before ship. 
when I got this idea for it, it totally changed it. The idea is there's this vertical cannon and you have to like run in there and you're slowing down the cannon, but because you're moving away from the circle, you get time back so that you're going faster than the cannon and you're able to make it up there. Otherwise, you can't make it up those stairs without getting shot. Um, that was cool, and it was using a vertical pat a cannon, which again, because I'm doing a lot of pattern breaks, in my mind as a designer anyway, and because the player knows they're coming to the end of the game, it like helps uh, amplify the feeling of culmination, right? That something's happening here. We're not just repeating the same old things. We're, new things are happening in a weird way and in a, um, in a complexifying way. Uh, the final world. Um, So there's a few levels that lead up to this uh, final level. Um, and there's a sort of cutscene that plays. And the idea behind this level is, uh, you know, you can play it, and then you look at it in reverse, and it shows you something different in reverse than you saw playing it forward. Um, and there's this dialogue in it. Um, the reason the original dialogue happened is just because in Donkey Kong, uh, whatever her name is in that game, um, she's not a princess in the game, I don't think. She's just like, uh, something. she has a name. Um, she's just saying help up at the top all the time. And so I felt like, oh, well, she ought to be saying help at this level. Um, and, uh, oh man, there used to be bananas down there. We took them out. David didn't want to redo the bananas. But there, there were like, yeah, um, there used to be bananas in that little pit where the night guy is standing. Um, subtly, like most people wouldn't have noticed it. Anyway. Um, and uh, so from that came the idea that maybe there should be a little bit of a dialogue here. And uh, it, it became, you know, almost like a palindrome. Let's find a dialogue that has a different meaning forward than it does backward, right? And so forward, it's like she's asking for help to get away from him. And he's like saying, come down here in anger or whatever. And, uh, you know, going the other way, I won't play all the way through, but going the other way, you know, she says help you know, asking for help, running away, and he's being helpful and says, hey, come down here, I'll get you out, and he carries her out and up the vine. The vines are sort of like a, a Donkey Kong Jr. or whichever, whichever that first arcade game was where you kind of like spray the, the DDT at the bugs. Um, it's kind of a callback to that. Um, so that's, uh, that's the highlights of what I want to say. So we have a little less time for this than I wanted, but um, for the next 20, 25 minutes, um, I figure it'd be cool to take questions about specific parts of the game, not including the stars, so don't ask. Um, and, uh, and just maybe illustrate that by a playthrough if it's relevant, or maybe just talk about it. So, um, do we have a mic to pass around? Or, yeah. So just raise your hand. Uh, gentleman in the blue shirt on the left here. The irreversible level. The irreversible level where you have two doors, two sets of doors, where you have to use the key twice, where you can, and the pattern you said about. And what's the fact that the first set of doors actually went off the screen and um, part of the design so the player wouldn't actually immediately recognize that there was a pattern? That the first set, oh, I see. Go over on the right hand side. Yeah. I, sorry, it's, it's a little hard to hear the question, um, but I get you. Yeah, so um, the answer is yes, sort of. Um, in reality, though, um, there's a more direct answer, which is just that I wanted to focus on this first part. Um, you know, you can see that there's something down there, right? You can see that there's another key and there, there's like some reason that, that you want to go. I could have easily made the shaft deeper and had no hint of where you're going, but I wanted to motivate the player. Um, but I also wanted to make it pretty clear that there's not that much here to deal with. There's just one key, and you have to figure out how to get through three doors. Now, again, if I wanted to be really minimalist, I could have broken this into its own level, because it shares a level with that earlier stuff that's kind of complicated, and that can produce confusion. But um, I felt like the thematic grouping was more important, and um, so I, I settled with uh, kind of having a camera position here that focuses on the, the main task at hand. Um, 
So you, you know you can a little bit see the corner of a gate down there if you're not on a crappy HDTV, which letterboxes, which most of them do. Um, yeah, but but so uh, if and part of part of this turned out that this is the way that I let, laid out the level first, and then I just tweaked it a little bit. Um, but if it had turned out that those other gates were on the screen at the same time as all this, I would have changed it. I would have put them lower because it's too much information that's not relevant right now. You know, if you could see that there is a pattern, it's it's not relevant yet. It's not relevant until later. Uh, questions, uh, Chris? Go up the ladder. Go up the ladder. Uh, yeah. So why do some oh, man screw here? Hold on. Yeah. You got to take care of this rabbit before you. Would, I, you can get away from him, but you have to do it by solving the puzzles and going way off to the side. Wow, I, I stood there talking a long time. Okay, so uh, that flower that you're about to approach makes a rabbit, but the one on the other side doesn't. Yeah. Why? Um, well, why do some flowers not? In, in code, uh, these guys are called the mimic, and the original idea from day one that I put them in was that they're mimicking totally nice flowers. And in fact, if you go and replay a game, or you play the speedrun, um, wow. um, there are these flowers in the game prior to when you ever see the rabbits, right? And they're just there, but you probably don't pay much attention to them. And then all of a sudden, they're deadly, right? Um, and even after you see them, yeah, they're this smattering. Some of them are nice, and some of them aren't. And uh, ultimately, why? Like, um, it's just a judgment call, you know. Like again, there's that idea that like, oh, maybe, maybe only flowers should ever be rabbits. Um, but that didn't, you know. I wanted, I wanted the extra moment of. Uh, not knowing, or of freaking out and then having it be nothing the first time to add to that feeling of newness in a level. You know, like, so, this is where I segue into a topic from a, a lecture I just gave. Um, I didn't understand it at the time, but it, with the lens of hindsight, this is a sort of Skinnerian technique a little bit, but not obviously, right? It's of not knowing what's next and of anticipation in, in a tiny dra dramatic climax, every, if you're paying attention every time you approach a flower, right? Um, the reason I say it's Skinnerian is because that's how, um, you know, like that's how, uh, you know, like Diablo style games work all the time, right? One of the reasons they're addictive is that you break open a barrel or you kill a monster and you don't know what you're going to get. There's an anticipation and then a reward, right? Well, here it's not a reward, it's the opposite. So it's not totally Skinnerian, but it's using that anticipation for little events, right? If you play a game, this is where I get in trouble, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, if you play a game uh, made by uh, someone who doesn't seem to understand RPGs that well, design-wise, right? Um, like certain games that were re released in the past couple months. Um, every time you break open a barrel, there's like the same number of coins all the time. And it's a, it's a fixed reward for doing it. That's not only known as not as effective of a scary thing. Maybe they were doing it for ethical reasons, but I doubt it. I think it's because they really didn't understand that part of the game design. and. Um, didn't understand that there's a lot of that there's a little mini dramatic arc to be had all the time from that, um, you know, from not knowing how many coins you're going to get or if there's no coins or if the barrel's going to explode and you take damage, right? So it, it becomes boring very quickly if you're just breaking the barrel and getting three coins every time. So I didn't understand this with that level of clarity back when I did this, but I had, I kind of did, you know, and, and that's that's what I think informed that decision. Other questions? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, in the epilogue, I don't remember how to do it, it's been so long. Wait, I gotta go here. The epilogue is actually World 8, secret. Nobody ever knew this, but um, I think if I go here and then come back now. Okay. Um, I'll run through it really fast so you can see it doesn't, doesn't take that long because I'm not going to actually solve any of the puzzles. So this is an interesting thing. Uh, the epilogue, which I neglected to talk about, um, actually has puzzles in it, but they're puzzles that are not connected to rewards. They're just things that you can notice. Uh, it's also full of pattern breaks. It's like this is where the world's falling apart. Remember I talked about that rule about things that are uh, uh, high detail are collidable and they're not, you know, they're solid foreground and you know you can't run through them. But we start violating that, like, oh, you go behind this thing and like you fall through this ostensibly solid ground and you're like, what the hell, you know? Um, so the idea here is the world's falling apart a bit. Um, 
but you might wonder, like, what's all this stuff? Like, okay, there's some text there, which I guess is fine, but like, what? What's this about? So there are puzzles here. Um, and this was my experiment with, uh, do players, how willing or what percentage of players will notice that there are actually puzzles to solve here and that that's what these things are for? And how many people will just run through it and kind of finish the game and, and not think about it, right? Um, I don't actually have numbers on that. But here's the cloud he was talking about. There's this cloud and there's like uh, brave conspiracy theorists uh, out on the internet who like swear this cloud is for something. And the reason that they think that, there's a very good reason to think that, which is that pretty much everything else in the game has a reason. Um, you know, I talked about there's one or two things that don't have very strong reasons, like there's a cannon here, or a couple monsters there, that if I were to do it over, I would take out. Um, the reason why this cloud is here is not very verbalizable to me, um, but it's something about it's something about victory. It's something about having a beautiful vantage point that I can just stand on and feel successful about. Um, it just felt right that my castle not only encompasses some blocks that were made, but like also some of the elements that were previously antagonistic to me, or something. I just wanted, you know, I, I wanted it to be in a position where I could kind of look down at the text, you know, when he looks down like that or whatever. I wanted to be high up looking down. And just when I built a castle like this or when I added a rampart, it didn't feel the same. Um, so again, it's a pattern break. It's like everything in the game means something except for this. And I've said pattern break so many times in this lecture that you might get the feeling like, oh, well, there's almost no patterns in the game. But actually, most of these patterns are very consistent until they're broken. Uh, so yeah, um, I guess I've never answered that officially. But yeah, there is no gameplay purpose to this cloud. <laughs>